The following is a production of Cary TV, the town of Cary's government access channel. to order the April 28th meeting of the Cary Town Council. Wow. And at this time, I'd like to recognize Mayor Pro Tem Yerha, who will lead our ceremonial opening. Mr. Yerha. Thank you, Mayor. April's been a busy month in Cary. Uh, it started out at a recent meeting <laughs> proclaiming the month as Cary, Fit Cary Month, you call that. And it's going to end April tonight with a proclamation for Cary Earth Day coming up this Saturday. Um, there was something else happens in April each year. Uh, April's Carrie's birthday month. Carrie was incorporated officially on April 3rd in what year, Council? 1871. A little weak, but that's good. <laughs> Read the seals. 1871. And um, looking back in April 3rd, 1871, of course, the founding family were the pages. And their homestead was standing here just about where we're all sitting tonight. The only thing left from that homestead is the smokehouse, which is standing out in the Page Walker Garden. Uh, the Page Hotel was here in 1871. Yes, the Page Hotel. The Walkers didn't come into the picture until the 1880s. They were Johnny-come-latelys. Um, so it was just the Page Hotel at that time. The first school had just um, opened uh, right at the site of the Cary Arts Center today. That was at the foot of South Street. It became South Academy Street because of after the Academy was there, they renamed the street, but it was South Street at that time. Uh, the mayor, of course, was Frank Page. And contrary to popular belief, Jack Smith was not on the council <laughs> at that time. There was the obligatory Jones on the council. Joneses were, were all over town. And one of the early council, one of the first council people in town was H.B. Jordan, who was a direct descendant, direct ancestor rather, of the Jordans who we all know today. The town was one square mile in size. It was measured exactly one half mile in each direction from the railroad station. And the population was approximately 150. Not 150,000, <laughs> but 150. So this year is the 145th anniversary of Cary. Not really a milestone, but in five years, there will be a milestone, the 150th anniversary. There are a lot of people in town who remember the 100th anniversary of Cary, the centennial celebration. I think there's a couple sitting in the front row who remember the centennial celebration of Cary. Oh, and one sitting up here. How do you like that? Um, all the men were asked to grow beards in 1971. I couldn't back And you I couldn't still back have then. yours. No, I couldn't back then. Isn't that something? Um, everybody dressed up in period costume. There were parades. Commemorative coins were issued. Jerry Miller designed a special town seal for the centennial year. 
and there were plates that were produced. <laughs> and you just you produced one. Happened. Just so happened, you our, one. our town clerk, who has become quite a Harry Carey history buff, <laughs> has pre presented us here with a, an example of one of those plates. And I'm going to pass this down the council out because she doesn't trust me to keep it. And Michael <laughs> hand it back to, to Ginny when it's, when it's all over. And as I pass it down to you, take a look. There's an error on the plate. See if any of you could find the error and you can tell me about it, about it later. Uh, and according to Around and About Carrie, the mayor at that time had asked that women refrain from wearing lipstick, perfume, jewelry, or bleaching their hair. Oh, for the anniversary year to reflect back on 1871. And that proclamation by the mayor was completely ignored. <laughs> <laughs> so I wouldn't advise doing that for the 150th. Um, but I do hope that talking about this inspires us to uh, start thinking about the 150th. Those five years are going to fly by, and I wouldn't want to miss the boat. So in conclusion, in 1971, at the 100th anniversary, the North Carolina General Assembly passed a resolution commending Cary and recognizing its 100th anniversary. And it said, I quote, uh, they commend Cary for retaining the warm, friendly atmosphere that it, uh, it had acquired when it was a small rural town. Of course, the population in 1971 was a bustling 9,000 people. So to have that warm, friendly atmosphere from a rural town of 150 was quite something. But I'd like to think that in five years, the General Assembly might be able to pass exactly that same resolution. Don't you think? Warm, friendly town. So start thinking about the 150th. And in the meantime, you can all join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Gerhard. That was quite fascinating. I need to get some of that on Carry Matters. Just let him do the ceremonial you should, you opening every time. Carry Matters. Yeah. There you the, go. Uh, <laughs> I was on P and Z. I wasn't elected. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just on P and Z. <laughs> All righty. Uh, first thing we need to do is adopt the agenda. Is there an inter, inter? Is there a motion to do so? So moved. Thank you. Motion and a second discussion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Takes us to item number two, recognitions, reports, and presentations. Item 2.1, Ms. Bush will be presenting a, a proclamation designating April 30th, 2016 as Carry Earth Day to our Environment Advisory Board Chair, Dana Widmeyer, and Sustainability M Manager, Emily Barrett. Oh, you're already there? I don't think we should waste any time. Hello, ladies. Well, it is a... Uh... It is April, and we did start with Carry, Fit Carry Month, and we're ending, as you just aptly said, with the um, Carry Earth Day, which we will be celebrating as a town on Saturday. So I hope I will see all of you. Well, obviously, we'll see all of you at our special meeting Saturday morning. But then at the end of the meeting, we can go across and, and celebrate Earth Day at Spring Days. So the proclamation for, that designates April 30th as Carrie Earth Day, whereas we are fortunate to live in a region so bountifully endowed with natural assets, and we feel a responsibility to preserve our environment by keeping it clean, healthy, and beautiful. And whereas the town of Cary has designated April 30th, 2016 as Cary Earth Day 2016, a day in which citizens are particularly encouraged to reflect upon how we can work together to preserve the health of our community by caring for our environment. And whereas the town would like to give special recognition to celebrating an important anniversary, the 25th year of our curbside recycling program, and whereas the town accepts over one dozen types of materials at the curb as part of our ongoing commitment to divert waste from the landfill. And whereas in 2016, the town will be opening our first all ages community garden at Carpenter Park, helping to build strong bonds between participants and the natural systems that sustain us. 
And whereas in 2016, seven neighborhoods in the Cary Green Neighborhood Project are working together at the household level, as well as on a community level, to contribute to the environmental health of our town. And whereas the town of Cary on April 30th, 2016, will observe Earth Day 2016 by holding an event in conjunction with Spring Days at the Bond Park, where there will be informational booths about town programs and services that help preserve and protect the environment. Now, therefore, I, Lori Bush, on behalf of the entire Cary Town Council, do hereby proclaim April 30th, 2016, Cary Earth Day 2016, and I encourage all of our citizens to join in the observance of planned events. Proclaim this 28th day of April 2016. Thank you. Thank you, Lori, for this pro proclamation and also for the Council's commitment to Cary's environment. Earth Day is a special opportunity to express support for environmental protection ap activities that improve quality of life. I would like to take a moment and thank Lori, Emily, all of the Council, the staff, and EAB members who play key roles in environmental protection. In particular, I'd also like to mention Sarah Justice, the town's Environmental Outreach Program Coordinator. With direct outreach, we are able to reach citizens daily, engaging each of us in our role to protect Cary's environment. In Cary, we are blessed with a very high-quality environment. The three pillars of sustainability are environment, economics, and equity. The town has unique opportunities and responsibilities to protect the environment, to consider the economic impact, and to ensure benefits are available to all citizens. Attention to the interrelationship between our personal choices and the choices guided by municipal regulation and incentive allows us to preserve what is great about Cary. And the town's reach extends well beyond our boundaries into in very important ways. The town has a long history of taking effective science-based action to help protect the region's drinking water supply and key recreation amenity, Jordan Lake. Today, water supplied from Jordan Lake serves almost 180,000 people in Cary, Apex, and Morrisville, along with portions of Research Triangle Park and the Raleigh-Durham Airport. By 2040, the North Carolina Capital Area MPO projects growth in the metro area of nearly a million more people for a total of two million people metro-wide. Many will be attracted to Cary and the larger Jordan Lake service area. Protecting the sensitive environment of Jordan Lake is an important role. To remind citizens of the many resources the town offers, I'd like to personally invite everyone to join us this Saturday on Earth Day Lane at Spring Days in Bond Park. Town staff and volunteers will be available to answer questions and provide information <laughs> on the many town environmental protection activities. With that, I'll turn it over to Emily and she'll give us a few more specifics about some of the programs. Thanks, Dana, and thank you to the other Environmental Advisory Board members as well. And thank you, Council, for your support of sustainability initiatives in all town departments. I'd like to mark this 46th annual Earth Day celebration by thanking all citizens and staff, because we each do our part. From the busy mom who takes time to recycle and teach her children to keep it loose in the cart, <laughs> to the town employee who takes time to flip off the light, drive efficiently, or help a citizen with questions about environmental services and opportunities, it all adds up. And working together makes a difference. So let's celebrate and keep improving. In addition to the important items that you heard from Dana and during the proclamation, I'd like to especially recognize the neighborhoods in the Cary Green Neighborhood Project. They have active volunteers and are helping their neighborhoods to leave and lead in environmental stewardship. Their Boundary Village Apartments, Buckhurst West, Highland Oaks, Lockmere, Regency Communities, Rigsby Farm, and Stony Brook Estates. 
You may remember about this time last year, we kicked off a partnership with the National Wildlife Federation in an effort called the Cary Garden for Wildlife Program. Since that time, we've had an impressive level of participation with over 200 homes, six common areas, and six schools committing to easy actions to support wildlife, including our favorite, the three bees, birds, bees, and butterflies, who are pollinators and very important. We encourage you to invite others to participate when you're out and about in the community. We're about 70% of the way toward that national designation of a wildlife-friendly community, and I believe we'll get there this year. Happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day. Thank you, Ms. Barrett. Thank you, Ms. Widmar, for all you do to help Cary be clean, green, and beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. And join us on Spring Days. Okay, we're going to move to our next item. It's Public Speaks Out. We've included <coughs> instructions for speaking at this forum on the printed agenda. And if you'd like to speak at this forum, please take a seat in the rows to my right that are shown as reserved and follow the instructions on the agenda. Public Speaks Out speakers have up to three minutes for their comments, and speakers may speak on any topic as long as it's not a public hearing. I'll enforce the three-minute time limit to be fair to all of our speakers. There's a timer located on the podium, and when the green light turns yellow, that means you have 30 seconds remaining, and when the yellow light turns a, to a flashing red, that means your time has expired. And at that point, I'll interrupt you, not trying to be rude or mean, <coughs> but trying to be fair to all of our speakers. And I would thank all of our speakers in advance for adhering to our three-minute time limit. We also would ask that if you're here with a group, that the group have a spokesperson on behalf of the group to reduce repetitive comments. And I thank everyone in the audience for understanding that this is a business meeting. Please do not applaud and make remarks from your seats or anything else that might distract from this meeting. So now's the time for Public Speaks Out, and I would invite our first speaker forward. Just wait for those to get passed out. Go ahead and begin. Mr. Mayor and members of the Town Council, my name is Travis Getz. I live in Carpenter Village at 113 Laurel Reef Lane and have lived in the community since 1999 with my wife and three children. As you know, the developers of Carpenter Village have applied to the town of Cary to rezone the undeveloped area of the community's village center. The request states that this proposed zoning amendment would replace the previously approved 65,000 square foot designated for retirement center with residential use to allow up to 27 townhomes and up to 48 attached residential dwelling units. Further, the zoning amendment sets forth the following criteria that should be considered in reviewing rezonings. Specifically, number five states that the proposed rezoning will not have significant adverse effects on the property in the vicinity of the subject tract, and number six, that the proposed zoning classification is suitable for the subject property. I believe that this rezoning will have significant impacts on the property in the vicinity of the subject tract and is not suitable for the subject property. The developers are requesting that the town modify the current zoning to allow buildings four stories in height instead of the three stories currently allowed. Here is the rendering of the front of the proposed commercial slash condominium buildings. Please look at image number two on the handout. It's on the top of the second page. Point number six of the Town Council Impact Statement for the 1998 approved rezoning states <coughs> that, as has been demonstrated through the phases now under construction, the developers have a strong commitment to the existing plan and will continue to make every effort to closely follow the plans now shown. Here is a rendering of the Village Center shown in that 1998 rezoning, which is the same rendering used both in the original zoning and as a marketing tool by the developer when we bought our first home in the neighborhood in 1999. Please look at image number one in the handout. It's on the first page. The current Village Center zoning states that buildings shall be a minimum of two floors and a maximum of three floors. One floor buildings may be permitted with the intention that architectural compatibility and scale be maintained. Per the developer's representative, the proposed co commercial slash condo buildings are to be approximately 64 feet tall, while the existing village center buildings are no higher than 34 feet tall. 
the current zoning document goes on to state that all commercial and office areas will be developed to a unified architectural theme and will be architecturally compatible in building materials and colors within the village core. Here is a comparison of the various heights of buildings in both Carpenter Village and other nearby developments. Please look at image number three in your handout. A comparison of the developer's proposed plan and buildings to that of the existing plan and the buildings in the village center show that the developer has lost his strong commitment to the existing plan and is no longer making every effort to closely follow that plan. The proposed four-story buildings are almost twice as tall as other existing village center buildings and are clearly not compatible in scale as required by existing zoning. Additionally, the proposed building's massing, lack of exterior articulation, and low-pitched roof lines do not support a unified... Sorry, I have to interrupt you. Your time has expired. If you would like to leave your comments with the clerk, she will make sure we get a copy of it. I'll that. do that. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Next speaker for Public Speaks Out. Thank you for allowing us to speak up. We're here talking about the uh, Celio uh, Whitney Association uh, rezoning, and uh, sorry, annexation rezoning, um, 4.7 on your agenda. We wanted, we're homeowners in the uh, bordering. Could you give us your name, please? My name is Tim Hill, I, and uh, would you like to give your name? Dr. Jalen Parikh. We live in the Grenadier uh, development that borders this proposed uh, annexation and rezoning. We're not necessarily opposed to the annexation or the rezoning, um, but we do want to ensure that there's a buffer of forest or natural area between our property and uh, the, the new uh, development that's proposed. And the reason for that is um, uh, it, right now it has a very substantial forest um, uh, area that, that travels through and it would benefit both our neighborhood and the new neighborhood. So we don't see this as a negative. And also there's wet soil between our property and this proposed annexation and development. So we don't see why that should be clear-cutted and uh, we don't see why uh, it should be uh, developed uh, any closer than, uh, and we're not actually sure what the proposed uh, development plan is. We haven't had an uh, opportunity to see that from the developer. But anyway, that our concern is to make sure that the forced buffer remains. Anything you want to add? Yeah, I own the property on 4020 Shaman Drive, and um, our we don't mind having a new neighborhood, uh, but our only uh, concern is. Uh, I'm going to interrupt you. I was trying to figure out which topic you were it's talking about. I'm sorry. It's 4.7 on your agenda tonight, Celia Whitley annexation. So it's a public hearing, right? The, the rezoning. It's a rezoning. The annexation is part of consent, but the, that annexation is part of rezoning that is on the public hearing. Yeah, so okay. it's part and part, but we'll we'll just leave it as. Okay. Yeah. If you'd like us to come back, we'll, we'll be glad to do that. Hold on, hold on just a minute. We're going to give you some more time once I get this straightened out. So this is on the consent agenda to call for public hearing. The annexation um, is on the consent agenda for, to call for the public hearing. The rezoning, the re related rezoning is the 1010 road rezoning, which is um, the under the public hearings. Under the public Item hearings. 5.3. So, so if I could get you to come back, we'll be glad when we to get to that. public hearings, you'll have more time to okay. speak. Okay. All right. All Very right. Good. I'm sorry to interrupt. Is that you. another part of this meeting? Yes, it okay. is. We'll, we'll do that. All right. Maybe All righty. Um, anyone else to speak at public speaks out? If you're here for public hearings, we'll get to that in a little bit. Anyone else for public speaks out? Seeing no one, we'll close public speaks out. And we'll move to the consent agenda items. If I can get this all to work correctly. And keep in mind, the uh, consent agenda items have one vote to approve all of the items. And um, I'm going to read all the items on the consent agenda. Um, so that people at home uh, watching on TV will understand what the consent agenda includes. 
includes. Uh, on the consent agenda this evening, we have minutes, fiscal year 16, uh, community development block grant annual action plan. William and Billy annexation call for public hearings on Celia Whitley annexation and Venu Kadri annexation. For Kenda Bluffs rezoning and consistency statement, 2304 Piney Plains Road rezoning and consistency statement. Continuation of soccer park lease agreement with Carolina FC. Requested easements across two town owned properties. NCDOT draft feasibility study. Would council members like any of these items pulled for discussion? If not, I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. There's a motion. A second. And a second. Discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Now we're moving to the public hearings. And our first public hearing is the Cadre Property Rezoning 16 REZ03. Ms. Beerman, our, our staff, will present this item. We're going to open the public hearing and allow people to speak. Council will not take action on this item tonight. Instead, we're going to hear from, uh, we're going to refer this item to our Planning and Zoning Board for their recommendation. And it will come back to us in the future, at least a couple of months from now. So, Ms. Beerman, of our staff, will introduce the item. Ms. Beerman. Good evening, Mayor and Council. This is a request to rezone about 21 acres at 1304 Bachelor Road and 4309 Pine Rail Lane. This is a vicinity map. Uh, you can see the property outlined in yellow. Uh, Bachelor Road uh, extends to the south and ultimately connects to Green Level West Road. The existing zoning for this site is R40 watershed in Wake County. Uh, there is an annexation being processed separately with this case. The sufficiency uh, was just on your consent agenda. The final action and the public hearing will catch up with the rezoning case uh, at the same meeting when we bring the rezoning back to you for action. The proposed zoning for the site is R40 conditional use. The proposed zoning conditions would limit the land use to detached dwellings. This shows the land use plan. The designation is very low density residential in the southwest area plan. There are uh, some stream buffers shown on the site according to Cary's GIS maps and field determination of these features would be required as part of the site plan review. There are no facilities in the immediate uh, vicinity, according to the Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Resources Facility Master Plan. There, the American Tobacco Trail uh, is located a uh, distance to the east. This shows the uh, current transportation plan. Bachelor Road is shown as a collector on the existing CTP. Uh, as shown, it only connects to the south where it ties in with Green Level West Road, and it doesn't, um, it, uh, and it just uh, terminates basically at the subject property. The classification and alignment for Bachelor Road is being studied as part of the CTP update in Imagine Carry. And this is a map that shows a, uh, potential extens uh, extensions that could be considered as part of that process to create connections into the larger uh, existing street network. According, um, well, there are no existing or proposed transit facilities in the area. This map shows properties that were notified of the public hearing. And that concludes staff's comments. Following the applicant's comments in the public hearing will be available for questions. Thank you, Ms. Spearman. This time I would invite the applicant forward for their remarks. Good evening, Mayor and members of Council. Glenda Topp with Glenda S. Topp and Associates. Um, Ms. Spearman has done an excellent job, so I'm going to make it short. Um, this property is currently in Wake County. 
Um, we're asking for it to come into carry with the initial zoning of R40. Um, we're also asking for the conservation overlay district and the watershed overlay district since it is in Jordan Lake. Um, it is in the southwest area plan. The designation is um, very low density residential. Um, being in the overlay district, um, the applicant or at the time of the, the site plan comes in, you would either, one can either develop it under R40 or the regulations that are currently in the code for conservation overlay, which would allow um, smaller lots to 15,000 square feet if additional open space is provided. If you look on the map, um, you can see the areas to the west um, and I guess Northwest that are already um, zoned R40, they came in under the same basic zoning uh, request asking for R40 zoning conditional use, limiting the use to detached residential. And um, at the time they come in with their development plan, they have several options um, to comply with in terms of um, whether they would be developed as, as R40 or um, the overlay district requ requirements. Um, as was pointed out in the staff report, um, the request does comply with the land use plan. The Southwest Area Plan complies with the growth management plan. And we do feel that the land use and densities that would be permitted under the R40 are appropriate for this site and ask for your support. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Top. Okay, now's the time for the public hearing for 16 RE03. And it's my understanding that that's what these gentlemen uh, earlier were intending? No, 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 no that's no. a different one. Wow, I can't keep up with it. Man. Okay, therefore a different one. <laughs> I take that back. So now's the time for rezoning 16 RE03, and I would invite our first speaker forward. Anyone to speak at this public hearing? Seeing no one at all, we'll close this public hearing, open it up to council members for questions or comments. Seeing none, it'll go to the Planning and Zoning Board, our advisory board, for their recommendation. And unless there are changes, we're likely to see this in a couple of months. Yes. Correct? Okay, very good. We're now going to move to the second uh, public hearing, item 5.2, Hannah Property Rezoning 16 RE05. Ms. Grannon will introduce the side item. We're going to hold the public hearing. Council will not take action. Instead, we're going to refer it to the Planning and Zoning Board, and we'll see it at a future meeting. Ms. Grannon. Thank you. Good evening. This is a request to amend existing zoning conditions for property located at 1608 Kildare Farm Road. Subject properties a little less than half an acre, highlighted here in yellow. Aerial view shows the subject properties currently vacant. There are no stream buffers or floodways according to Kerry's most recent GIS maps. Kildare Farm Road is a major thoroughfare and there is an existing transit route along Kildare Farm Road. The land use plan designation is office and institutional. The existing zoning is office and institutional conditional use. The current zoning conditions limit the building size to 5,000 square feet limit the use to general office and or medical office, um, have restrictions on the height of lighting fixtures, limit the building setback uh, to, or extend the typical building setback so that it's 60 feet from the western property line, uh, limit any uh, signage on the building to signage facing Kildare Farm Road. The proposed zoning does not change any of those conditions except the use. When the applicant submitted this uh, over a year ago, they were planning to have a medical office building and the owner of the building wanted to reside in the building. It was overly conditioned when he submitted his site plan and showed a proposed residential use on the third floor of the building. The planning staff said, uh, wait a minute, you need to correct that. So what's proposed now would be to allow residential use in a non-residential building and retail sales and service, again, in an office building. So that means that it would be limited to 20% if they wanted to have retail sales and service and limited to no more than 50% for residential use, provided at least 50% of the building is office. Property owners within 800 feet of the subject property were notified the property was posted. There was general support expressed at the neighborhood meeting 
there was a neighbor who was concerned about the potential impact if multiple dwellings were proposed with this. This concludes staff's presentation. Uh, following the applicant's comments and the public hearing will be available for your questions. Thank you, Ms. Cranon. This time I'll invite the applicant forward for their remarks. Hello, uh, Glenda Topp with Glenda S. Topp and Associates. Um, and I should have said good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, I'm here tonight representing Dr. Hanna, who does own the property. Um, as Ms. Granin pointed out, his rezoning was approved in January 2015. And as it turns out, we wrote the use condition too restrictive for Dr. Hanna to use the building as he intended to. Um, and this did not come up until the pre-application meeting for the site plan. And as staff pointed out, um, he couldn't do it. So it was suggested that for him to be able to do what he originally intended to do, that he come back with a zoning request, which is one of the things that we did um, bring up at the neighborhood meeting in terms of being asked why the rezoning. The rezoning is to allow him to use the property as he originally intended. Um, as Ms. Granin pointed out, the in the ONI zoning district, it does spell out by right that you can use a percentage of the office building for residential, and you can also use a percentage of it for retail sales, but again, you've got to meet the standards within those sections. Um, so for example, for the retail sales, you can't, you know, it talks about interests and all those types of things. And again, what, what he had intended on doing for that also, which is what he's doing today, is the ability, and again, I know this isn't a zoning condition, but for the use that he has, there are products that get sold with it. But again, um, the zoning conditions or that one condition was too restrictive. Nothing else is changing. Um, on the property as far as it relates to conditions. As many of you know, Dr. Hanna currently resides and has his business across the street. Um, and what he is looking to do, as when it was originally approved, is to move across the street, have his medical practice, and live in the building. So that concludes uh, my presentation. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. And we ask for your support. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Topp. Now it's time for public hearing 16 RA05, the Hanna property, and I would invite the first speaker forward. 16 RA05, anyone to speak on that rezoning? Uh, good evening, respected mayor and members of the Cary Town Council. <clears throat> My name is Tani Kumar Charan. Since September 1980, my wife and I have been living in our home located at 105 Ronald Speed Drive in the McGregor Downs subdivision of Cary. We have been living there for the past 35 plus years. The Hana property we are talking about is located right behind our home. Since the current owner has not built anything or developed anything, we request the Cary Town Council to consider all possible future outcomes. <clears throat> the property owner's intention is to develop the property into a facility where he will have his medical office and his residence. If this is truly his intent, then no harm is caused to him by having the condition that the property has no more than one dwelling unit. Therefore, we request the town council to put a restriction on this property that there should not be more than one dwelling unit. So let me repeat. The property owner's intention is to develop the property into a facility where he will have his medical office and his residence. If this is truly his intent, then no harm is caused to him 
by having the condition that the property has no more than one dwelling unit. The above restriction is essential because without the restriction, the property owner's plan may change after the approval of the zoning and he may build any number of dwelling units based upon the total size of the structure, making the property's use drastically different. Or when he or his heirs sell this property, the new owner may use this property for a very different purpose. For example, the new owner may build many dwelling units and rent them. It is essential to maintain the residential character of the neighborhood, which is the McGregor Down subdivision, which is right, right next to that. Any multi-dwelling would cause serious security problems in our neighborhood, in addition to lowering the values of the houses in our neighborhood. Therefore, we request the town council to have the condition that this property has no more than one dwelling unit. Thank you. Next speaker for this rezoning, please. Good evening. First time visitor, so excuse me if I don't know exactly how to conduct myself, but I'll be polite and say good night or good evening, Mayor, Town Council. So I'm Thani's neighbor. Um, I live at 107 Ronaldsby. I'm Austin Trippensy. Um, I got to say, I really appreciate the staff. I know I've talked to Deborah multiple times and she's answered a lot of my dumb questions, being new to this whole process. Um, so I don't know where to start or begin. I guess I just got a few points. Um, you know, I, I have no problem with somebody developing the property back there. Um, and uh, my neighbor and I have kind of talked about a few points. Uh, I guess the thing I would want to raise to the town council, I'm not sure what you're aware of or not aware of, but as I understand the zoning, they're supposed to be maintained an opaque buffer on the back side of this property, the, the piece that comes up to my property. And I don't know what the, the, the proper definition of opaque is, but I know recently, I'm not sure if the town's aware of this, someone has come in and there's actually a cemetery, a family cemetery in the rear of this property. And they've come in there and they've, they've cleared it out. I have no problem with someone taking good care of a cemetery. I mean, obviously we should show respect, but it's a lot less opaque now than it was before. And so I guess the concerns I would have and ask the town to you know, get clarity on are, in the plans, what is the intended use of the opaque buffer? Because now that they've cleared away a lot of the opaqueness, it's more transparent than it was. You know, it used to be opaque. Um, and while there is supposed to be a 60-foot setback, how is that impacted or changed by them? And I, like I said, I appreciate them taking care of a cemetery. But um, my understanding is it's, it's less opaque now. Um, as my neighbor kind of suggested, you know, if he really intends to live there, he only needs to have one residence. And so I think um, the, the town should only consider a proposal by the applicant when they put that, that restriction on the property. Now, he might say, well, maybe I need more than that. And if he intends to truly live there, he doesn't need more. I mean, what I'm thinking here is I've lived in this neighborhood for two years. I lived in Cary for a lot longer. Um, this area of Cary is transformed drastically in the last few months. I mean, we have the development across Kildare Farm. I suspect, um, you know, a zoning change, as we all know, can have a huge impact on the value of a property. And so it's not clear to me if his intent really is he wants to live there or he needs this zoning change to enable him to sell it for a lot more to somebody else. I know the neighboring property recently in the past few years had a zoning change, and I believe the applicant there made all these claims about how he wanted to develop the property, but today he's got it listed for sale. So um, I've got concerns about, you know, the applicant's, you know, true intent. So I would say, hey, the town should go along. I don't want to get in his way, but only, you know, approve a um, uh, whatever you want to call it. Sorry, don't have the terminology where he basically limits the use to having just one residence. 
I don't understand the need for retail. My question is, does he do retail business currently in his business across the street? And if the answer is no, then what's changed about his business that would now require him to do retail? Because um, my understanding of being a physician, he's done what he's been doing for a long time. So I don't know that we really need to add retail. I mean, there's plenty of empty retail spots, either up or down Kildare Farm Road. I'm sure the people who own that retail property would love to make him a tenant and he can do retail business somewhere else. I mean, if he just wants to come in and have his medical office and live upstairs, I think the town should approve that, but I think we should make sure that, you know, it, he has those, um, uh, what were they called, the overly, uh, over-conditioned statements to make sure that, you know, it kind of protects his intent. So with that, I'll give you back a minute. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thanks. Anyone else to speak for rezoning 16 re 5 Either one, miss. Thank you very much. Good evening, and thank you for allowing me to make my small presentation. I live at 200 Glasgow Road. My name is Patrick Sweeney. Glasgow Road, as you may know, is the shortcut between Kildare Farm Road and Route 64. I've seen less traffic on Broadway <laughs> at 25 miles an hour. The property we're talking about is going to be to the south of Glasgow Road. The speed limit on Kildare Farm Road is 45 miles an hour but it's seldom 45 miles. I clock around 55 to 60, and with no one using turning signals. Between 8 and 10 in the morning, 11 to 1 in the morning, 4 to 6 in the evening, it takes sometimes five minutes to go from Glasgow Road to turn either left or turn right. Why? You have all of the traffic coming from Tryon Road, which is heading west, turns right on the Kildare. You have the Tryon traffic going north or east, turning left. At one end of Kildare, we have two very large shopping malls. You got Harris Teeter, you got Walmart, you got Hall Foods. You got a hospital, you got a fire station, and you have a daycare center. Traffic turning at Waverly Place cannot make the left turn at four to five o'clock. The left lane fills up, it goes on to the other lane, so you now have one lane of traffic trying to go down Kildare Farm Road, which backs up the rest of the traffic. Presently, I don't know what is being built across the street from the property that we're looking at, but whatever it is, they had to have an awful lot of cows present, and that odor continues till this day. How much traffic that's going to generate, I'm presuming you all should be aware of, otherwise you wouldn't have approved the construction. There is more franchise food service on Kildare Farm Road than anywhere else on the East Coast in that one mile. On Kildare Farm Road, if you're going to the north at five o'clock, four o'clock, try to cross Caraway Parkway within two lights. Tonight it was three lights getting here. Sometimes you can do it in two traffic lights. That's the wait. There's a lot of traffic on Kildare Farm Road. Next to the property that we're talking about here, there is a sign that says, we'll build to suit. I don't know what he's going to build to suit there. This property here. My concern is really retail. Retail is not necessary anymore in Kildare Farm Road, believe me. The traffic is absolutely horrendous. If you're going to fill it up, 
please do yourselves a favor, either get the speed limit reduced or move that traffic in a different way. The good news is that when an accident occurs on this property, you're only 500 yards to the firehouse and you're less than 500 yards to the hospital. <laughs> so the EMT will be there very quickly. I personally, only reason I'm even concerned with this, twice almost got nailed coming out of Glasgow. Now Glasgow is in Scotland, but we're in North Carolina. I don't want to be in heaven. So please look at this properly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker for 16 REZ05. Good evening, Mayor and members of council. I'm Dr. Hanna. I'd like to clear up a few things. I mean, this property is 5,000 square feet, by the way. And, um, you know, I was here about a year ago and I made it very clear to everybody, I want to live there. I want to preserve the cemetery, which I'm doing. And I've always planned to live there. I live, I live in my office presently and I don't have anywhere else to live. So I don't know where all this comes from that I'm not going to live there. And um, sort of I'll grow my place. I'm just going to move up the street. It's the same traffic. I've been, I've been here since 87, by the way. So, um, and I want to develop a very nice building. And by the way, I'm very into privacy. I don't really want to see the neighbors behind me. So when I'm done, it'll be opaque because I really don't want to see the people on Ronaldsby. So I'm not really worried about that. And um, the other thing is, is we, you know, I, I'm hired people to help me and they over restricted this thing to my chagrin. I had no idea that we weren't going to get what was in the ordinance and the ordinance says, in ONI, you can have 50% up to residential use and 20% up to retail use. It's nothing new. There's a 50,000 square foot building next to me that that can have all of that, but the neighbors aren't complaining about that 50,000 square feet next to my 5,000 square foot building. So my residence is presently planned to be 1,500 square feet on the third floor, but it could be up to 2,500 square feet in that building. But I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but presently, you know, I don't want to over restrict it because for whatever reason, and I think going from 15, going, beginning at 2,500 square feet, uh, re, you know, residential is not a big deal because the building next to me could be 25,000 square feet in residential according to the ordinance. So I don't know what the neighbors are upset about. I mean, because when you look at the whole thing, uh, it's a, a bit much. And um, so, and I don't think that, uh, you know, my little building is going to ruin the neighborhood, you know, and, and there's no plans for it to be five or six or ten units or whatever. And if you look at the, it's possible, but it's not probable because, you know, that's not the best use for the building is residential. The best use for that building is, is uh, uh, O&I for office. The other thing is uh, plastic surgeons do sell things. You know, we sell things like Latisse and uh, other, you know, products that uh, people use. I could also put a little spa in there, which is just part of the plastic surgeon's purview. And they sell different things like Obagi skin care. And, you know, there are things we do sell. I mean, we don't sell, you know, Starbucks coffee, but, uh, you know, we do sell things like that for our, our business. And so it's not made to be a commercial center or anything like that. So. Uh, it's not going to be competing with, you know, McDonald's or Taco Bell or anything like that, or Waverly Place. So, um, and and I think, you know, we're really overworking this thing. And, and uh, you know, I, I just want it to be a nice building that will look like a home. It will not look like a, a commercial building. And uh, we've been working very hard on that because I don't really don't really want to live in a commercial building. So it'll look like a home, it'll feel like a home, but when you walk in, part of it will be an office, which some of you have been in my office, looks like a home, acts like a home, but when you go in it, it's a doctor's office. So it's just the way it is. So that's what I like to duplicate. Do you have any questions for me so I could clear up anything about the property and my intentions or anything like that? 
We can't ask questions of you. This is your oh. time, not ours. Okay. But if we do, we'll ask you back later. Thank All you. right, and I would ask the council to not over, overly restrict my property. Uh, I think it's reasonable the way it is. I'm not planning to divide it up into five or six different residents or anything like that. I don't know even know why anyone would want to do that. So I would request that, that you just let it be as it is without, according to those ordinances that, are, that it provides for. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker for 16 or easy of five. Anyone else for this public hearing? Seeing no one, I'm going to close the public hearing and open up to council members for questions and comments. And I have a whole boatload of questions. Um, a lot of comments made about council making conditions. Council doesn't make conditions. Council we cannot. Need to be very clear about that. We <laughs> cannot make this, uh, any conditions at all. All conditions have to be offered by the applicant. Voluntarily, so, correct. So I just want to make sure everyone's very clear on that. So worst case scenario, which is what we have to look at. How many dwellings, how many different families, whatever, can exist in that building as uh, proposed? All I can answer is that the maximum square footage would be 2,500 square feet. So there so could be a dozen families there? How is that possible? Yeah, that's not realistic. I know. Yeah. Yeah. May I just interrupt for one and a half sure. second? The zoning goes with the land. It That's doesn't right. go with that particular structure. So if, if right, if Dr. Hanna. The, the zoning condition existing is that the maximum building size is 5,000 square feet. Uh, yep. zoning is condition. it reasonable to expect that there could be two dwelling units? Yes. Okay, even you, though he doesn't intend to do it, it could happen. Sure. In the that, future because it goes yes. with the land. So, so let's say he retires, moves away can't sell the office piece and another doctor, I mean, can't sell the residential piece and now another doctor is using office piece. Is that a non-compliant use now? 100% of the building could be office. Okay. All 5,000 square feet could be office. Okay. Um, so could, okay. So to clear that up, that discussion, all future outcomes, I think was the quote I heard. You can have an uh, all office building. You mm -hmm. can never have more than 2,500 square feet of residential. Correct. And the, um, I can't do the math in my head right Provi now. Okay, Retail. so 20%. retail's 20%, 1, maximum of 1,000 square 1, feet. Regardless, as Ms. Robinson said, it goes with the land, not with the owner or anything else. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're looking at. They cannot change that unless they come back here for a rezoning. Uh, Buffer requirements, uh, opaqueness is required? Is yes, a um, it's or? a 40-foot, it's an ordinance requirement. So there's a requirement for a 40-foot type A buffer. Um, we will investigate that. When I was posting the property, it appeared that there was still a vegetated buffer. There may have been some clearing that took place, but we will certainly look into that and, and investigate the, that. Okay, and then the last one I had is traffic, and it's just a comment. It's very unfortunate. Uh, it's the culmination of many things and includes our lack of authority to do a lot of things. Uh, it includes all the traffic going to Holly Springs, Fuquay, et cetera. It includes all the traffic going to Apex, taking a right there. And you have uh, conditions that we can't control that they have the right to do. Uh, we have thresholds that are met when we can require traffic mitigation. All those things together created the traffic outcome we have today. So to the gentleman that spoke of the traffic, yeah, we get it. And yeah, it's unfortunate, but that's the reality we live in, and we, we try to mitigate it as much as possible. To but, follow up on that, okay. though, it also includes this business's traffic that is already there across the street. Right. right. It's right. In a larger building. Right. So, so those are my questions that I hope I address some of that. I was trying to... Um, I think the only other thing I want to make clear is this property is already zoned. If count, uh, there was a comment wanted to go back to something, I can't remember. One of the speakers said it's our opportunity to go back. It's not. It's, it's already zoned for office Correct. conditional use. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing that's not allowed is the uh, residential. Correct. And so this would yeah. allow that. So if we turn this down, it's still going to be an office. Correct. Uh, so. right. Okay. 
Other questions, comments? My, my comment would be I have absolutely no concern with this as long as we investigate the buffer and make sure mm -hmm. that's mitigated and resolved. Um, I, I mean, gosh, in today's world, we're encouraging residential over commercial or office these days. It seems like a good fit. And we're talking about 5,000 square feet. I mean, okay. for a use that's already there. Other comments? Yeah, I was at, I was at that informational meeting. And I, you know, I don't. I don't think it's fair for me to summarize. I can't read people's minds, but let's just say most people, once they got the explanation, retail kind of threw some people off. But it's like going to get a haircut, and they want to sell you a shampoo. Yep. You know, it, it is so minimal. It, it's 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 laughable. Um, and um, I drive Glasgow virtually every day, and you know there is traffic at peak times. You know, as you said, is problematic. A lot of the homes, I always get a, um, I see the signs that say drive as if your kids lived here. That's on there. Please do it frequently. Have the, the monitors out. Um, um, and as always, when, when you have uh, some enforcement of speed, it's usually the neighbors. You know, it isn't the people going from point A to point B, which is, happens frequently over in Lockmere Drive. Um, when, when you look at it and you look at all the things that you've said and it's, we're talking 5,000 square feet, you know, it just, it seems like a well thought out use by a conscientious applicant. So. Other comments? Okay, this will go to our planning and zoning board and if there are no changes between now and then, we're likely to see it in a couple of Next months. Month. Mm -hmm. Very good. We're now going to move to our third public hearing. It's 1010 rezoning, 16 re one Ms. Bierman of our staff will present the item. We're going to open the public hearing. We will not take action on this item tonight. We're going to send it to our planning and zoning board for their recommendation, and we'll have it come back to us in the future. Ms. Bierman. This is a request to rezone about eight and about eight and a half acres at 3700, 3708, and 3716 1010 Road. This is a vicinity map. You can see the property outlined in yellow. The Grenadier subdivision that was mentioned earlier in Public Speaks Out is located immediately to the south of the site. The existing zoning on the property is R30 in Wake County. Um, again, uh, this evening you saw the sufficiency uh, statement in setting the public hearing in your consent agenda. Um, the annexation um, public hearing and action will catch up with the rezoning when this comes back before you probably in um, July or Ju June. The proposed zoning for the site is R8 conditional use. The zoning conditions would limit land use to 15 detached dwellings, which would be an overall density of 1.77 units per acre. It shows the land use plan. It is designated for low density residential use. There are stream buffers and floodways um, or stream buffers shown on the site according to Kerry's GIS maps that affect the southern portion of the property. The exact extent would be field determined at the time of the site plan review. Here you can see the park recreation and cultural resources facility master plan and there is a proposed greenway trail uh, along the eastern boundary of the property. This shows the uh, roads in the area according to our transportation plan. And the transit facilities, there are no uh, pro existing or proposed transit facilities along 1010 on this portion, but there are nearby facilities proposed in the future. This map shows properties that were notified of the public hearing. And that concludes staff's comments following the applicant's comments and public hearing will be available for questions. Thank you, Ms. Spearman. At this time, I would invite the applicant forward for their remarks. Good evening, Mayor, members of council. <laughs> I know. Who are you? Oh, I feel like I should be changing my outfit and I could be somebody different. <laughs> Oh, goodness. Um, 
Glenda Top with Glenda S. Top and Associates. Um, I'm here tonight representing um, the property owners. Um, as staff pointed out, um, the property is currently located in Wake County and it's zoned R30. Um, the land use plan calls for the property to be low density residential. Um, we are zoning it to R8 conditional use. Um, as staff pointed out, um, there is one condition um, that calls for a maximum of 15 dwelling units. When we originally submitted the application, we had a similar zoning condition in terms of the use um, was proposed to be detached residential, but we had it at a maximum density of three units per acre, which was the, the high end of um, low density. Um, after our neighborhood meeting and going back and talking to the property owners and the applicant, we revised the zoning condition and provided a maximum number of units or dwelling units that in turn would cap the density. And as staff pointed out, um, the density that's being proposed is 1.77 units per acre, which is quite a bit lower than what it was when, when um, we originally came in with the request. If you um, look in the area, there are still properties that are in Wake County, but the properties that are in the surrounding area, there's some that are zoned R8, there's some that are zoned R12, there's several PDDs that are in the area, and, of, and as you are, I'm sure, aware, at the intersection is a um, mixed-use overlay district um, of a community size. Um, with the changes that we've made to the request and limiting the number of units to 15, we do feel that the, the use and the density is appropriate for this location and ask for council support. And I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Top. Now's the time for public hearing 16 rez one the 1010 Road rezoning. And I would invite our first speaker forward. Now we have our return speakers. Uh, let me tell you that it's unusual that you have more than one at the microphone. If you do have more than one, I'm only going to give you five minutes. If you speak individually, you get five minutes each. You can do it however way you want. All right, thank you again for... Um, Could you state your name one my, more time? My name's Tim Hill. Thank I'm you. Grenadier resident, uh, 8100. Thanks again for allowing me to speak and... Um, Sorry I had to interrupt. No, yeah, for, I understand the process. Um, so again, we're not contesting the annexation or... And, and it's good news that we're hearing that the density of the lots is now um, lower than originally thought. Um, we really are concerned about the buffer um, between our properties and um, and we're also now concerned about the cut through that could possibly tie into Showmont Road, which is you see the the lower um, point of the property is touching the white road, which is called Showmont Drive. Um, we're not sure about whether the plan uh, plan development requires two exits out of the property, and um, that would be a a very big difference in the traffic flow to to and from uh, Grenadier. So um, uh, we need to understand more about the, the road connections, but we will mostly need to know about the setbacks, the buffer. The, in talking with one of the property owners uh, just outside the room, we understand they were offering a 20-foot buffer, vegetation buffer. Um, we think it may be better to, to be 40-foot, 50-foot, but that's to be negotiated perhaps um, after we see, I, I know there's no detailed plan, there's no site plan, there's just a, a proposal to annex prob property. So perhaps as homeowners, we, if we see what the developer has in mind, we might allay our concerns. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. We have another speaker. Good evening. Thank you, Mayor and Council members, uh, allowing us to talk. Um, my property just adjacent to the new development coming, and we are not opposing a new neighborhood in our area. 
Sorry. Okay. Oh, Jay, Jay Parikh? Yes, that's sorry. <laughs> I couldn't understand you at first. I didn't know if you said your name or not. Uh, as we say, we are not opposing a new neighborhood in our area, but uh, we just concerned about, uh, uh, we have got a wooded area in our backyard, and uh, we just uh, <clears throat> concerned about the safety and the privacy, and uh, as Tim mentioned, um, we like to preserve trees as much as we can, and we are asking uh, like a buffering zone. Uh, I know developer talked to us and says uh, initially said 10 feet, and now 20 feet. Uh, but I think is uh, as, as I <coughs> his team mentioned, I think uh, 50, 40 to 50 feet would be reasonable buffering zone, so we can have a privacy and also we can preserve the uh, natural reserve area in our subdivision. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker for 16 REZ01. Anyone else for this public hearing? Seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing. Uh, and I want to talk to Ms. Spearman about buffer requirements. These are like uses, so they're going to be what type? Yes, the, um, the required buffer would be a 20 foot landscape area. It would not be required to be within um, an actual buffer outside of the lots. However, on the southern um, portion of the property, there are potentially uh, stream buffers in this area. So even in the absence um, of an actual buffer, any, any area that would be determined to be in a stream buffer would, be, um, would not be included in any lot area. Right. Um, setbacks, we have minimum requirements for setbacks? Yes, we do. We have the, the, the minimum setbacks of the R8 zoning district would be required. Um, that would be um, a five foot um, minimum 25, or 20 foot combined side yard setback and a 20 foot rear setback. Okay, and then the connectivity, two exits required for this? Um, the connectivity, based on the number of units, um, I believe there would only be one, con one co connection to one road required. However, with the general connectivity requirements uh, to the surrounding lots, uh, that's something that uh, is looked at at the time of the site plan uh, review. The planning director does have the authority to waive connectivity in certain cases if it's not um, on, on the basis of environmental impacts and um, topographic constraints. So that could bring that as a possibility for that to be considered if that uh, is in fact uh, a buffered stream area and with to topographic issues. Otherwise, any relief from the general connectivity requirements would come through um, the town council as a quasi-judicial item. Very good. And the only other remark I have on this is, once again, uh, we cannot require uh, ex extra buffer conditions. They can be offered, but we cannot require them. Uh, one gentleman spoke, uh, he would rather us require 40 or 50 feet, and that's something we just can't do. We don't have that authority. So make sure everyone understands that. Uh, those are the questions and comments I wanted to make. Other questions or comments? No? Okay, so this will go to our planning and zoning board for their recommendation, and if they do not see any changes between now and that time, then we're likely to see this in a couple of months in July. Um, possibly in July. Possibly yes. in July. Okay, very good. Thank you, Ms. Spearman. We now move to our fourth public hearing. It's Comprehensive Plan Amendment 16, CPA 01, uh, for Luther Road Properties and Mr. Ramage of our staff will present this item. We're gonna open the public hearing. We're not gonna take action on this item. We're gonna refer it to our planning and zoning board for their recommendation, and it will come back to us at a future date. Mr. Ramage. Good evening. Uh, this case was uh, submitted by Ms. Kathy Rubens on behalf of her own property, uh, plus the properties of eight of her neighbors for a total of nine properties. The nine properties together total about 240 acres. The uh, amendment you'll be looking at tonight affects about 76 acres of their 240. But the amendment also does affect all or a portion of an additional 237 properties for about uh, 1,100 affected acres, and we'll 
talk about that as we move through the case. Um, the location of the property is in Cary's, uh, in the joint land use plan with Chatham County and the town of Cary, so it's, and it's just over the county line. This is a, on this slide you see a picture of the joint land use plan, Chatham County, town of Cary. Uh, the property is in the, uh, is circled on this slide just over the county line uh, south of uh, Green Level West Road. So this is a zoom in, uh, so you can see where the site is on Cary's land use plan. Um, our land use plan only incorporates uh, the part of the joint plan that is on the Cary side of what's called the rural buffer boundary in the joint plan, and we'll talk about that later. So you can see this, the site um, with the applicants, the uh, nine families, uh, and their properties are outlined in magenta. Ms. Rubin's uh, property has the uh, magenta triangle on the property. Luther Road, you'll see uh, labeled, it's at the southeast uh, side of the properties. Um, the properties are, uh, uh, we'll, we'll discuss the land use designations in a little bit, but you can see here a little bit better where they're all located and they all uh, hug up against the edge of Army Corps of Engineer property. <coughs> so this slide shows you um, some of the streams uh, in the area taken from USGS uh, maps. You can also see on the slide uh, the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineer property and the 100-year flood hazard area is in the very light green. You can see it going up uh, the core property uh, between the different applicant properties. This is an aerial photograph of the site. As you can see, this is the rural area. It's uh, <clears throat> either agricultural or in rural residential uses. Um, there's a mixture of forest and farm field and and cleared areas. Uh, the site is currently not in Cary zoning jurisdiction. It's in the joint plan in the area that may be served by the town of Cary. But you can see the nearest town of Cary zoning is a little ways away up the road at the um, right on the county line, the R40CU. These are some, some recent cases you've seen. Uh, that R40 piece you see a little ways from the property. Uh, actually also has um, conservation overlay district on it. But most of the area is currently under Chatham County zoning, and this slide is taken from the Chatham County GIS website, and you can see the properties uh, outlined in magenta again. They're zoned R1 by Chatham County, the R1 district in Chatham, which is all that blue area you see on this, on this slide. There's a, a couple pieces of industrial conditional use property scattered about, but they're too small almost to see on the slide. But most of this is all zoned R1 by Chatham, which is their rural residential zoning. It allows agricultural uses. It allows residential uses, minimum lot sizes of 40,000 square feet or larger. So similar to R40 and Cary, um, uh, R1, one unit per acre. Uh, this shows the site. Again, now we'll go back and look at the 2012 chatham Carey Joint Land Use Plan. So this is this effectively a special area plan that the site is located in. On this side, you can see we've shaded both sides. It's taken from the joint plan, so you see the consolidated recommendations. The site, all the properties uh, in the applicant group uh, are designated for the most part low-density residential in the joint plan, which allows uh, up to two units per acre uh, in the properties. Uh, a little bit to the west and south, you'll see these VLDR areas, which stands for very low density residential, and uh, density recommendations in those parts are one acre lots or larger, so less than one dwelling unit per acre. Well, at this point, I may also want to uh, provide just a little bit of background since we have the joint land use plan slide up, since there's a couple new board members on who weren't part of the process at that time. Uh, by a little bit of background, uh, the joint land use plan with Chatham County was developed between the years 2005 and 2012. It took about seven years to develop the plan. It was adopted in the summer of 2012 by both the Cary Town Council and the Chatham County Board of Commissioners. <coughs> the um, joint land use plan also has an a interlocal agreement, again adopted by both governing boards. The interlocal agreement basically says that both parties need to abide by the recommendations of the plan when approving development or rezonings anywhere in the plan area. Uh, the plan itself was actually developed by what was called the Joint Issues Committee. 
it was a committee that had initially two and later three, uh, I believe, uh, Carytown Council members and two Chatham County commissioners on it. And these it started out being five and grew to six, I think, eventually. <laughs> but these five uh, elected officials steered the process of actually developing the plan from 2008 until 2012. Uh, so there's a, there's a bit of history in this uh, project, and that history is going to be germane to some of the presentation that follows. I apologize ahead of time. Because this is an interlocal agreement that governs this, because there's a joint plan, uh, the explanation of what's being requested requ will require a little bit of dis uh, discussion tonight. One of the things <coughs> that's particularly germane to tonight's uh, request is that in the joint plan, there is what's called a rural buffer boundary. And in the slide in front of you, it's that yellow and black line that goes from the top of the slide to the bottom of the slide. That boundary basically in, in, in the plan says that if you're on the carry side or the east side of that boundary, future development can be developed with well and septic, or it could have water or sewer. Uh, public water and sewer only. In that case, the provider of, uh, would be the town of Cary. On the west side of the boundary, so on the left side on this slide, um, public water can be provided, but not any public wastewater or sewer services. So only, what, only septic fields can be used for treatment of, uh, of waste. Um, public water can be provided, and part of the reasoning for that is that Chatham County does have a uh, potable water line that goes up Farrington Road, which is the north-south road you see on the far left of the slide that crosses over the lake. <clears throat> so tonight's amendment request affects <clears throat> the plan document. It's a request to amend part of the document, not the map. So there's, before you was not a consideration to change LDR to MDR or something like that that you see on other plan amendments. It's actually a request to change text in the document. Specifically, the applicants are requesting that Section 3.4.2 in Chapter 3 of the Joint Plan be omitted, be deleted from the document. And the full text of 3.4.2 is in front of you. And it asks that that section requests <coughs> or recommends that special buffers be provided again next to Corps of Engineer property, but only in some locations and in some situations. The locations are you need to be south of Ludershop Road and Martha's Chapel Road, so it's kind of the bottom third of the joint plan area. Uh, the second thing is that it only comes into play if properties are being served with public utilities. So if a property connects and develops with either public water or public sewer or both, then a 400-foot undisturbed buffer needs to be provided next to uh, the Corps of en any Corps of Engineers property. So the request is to remove that uh, recommendation from the plan. This slide shows you the effect of that 400-foot buffer on the applicant's properties. So you can see here are the nine properties uh, south of Green Level West Road and west of Luther Road, which is why we gave the case that name. Uh, you can see all these properties hug Rocky Ford Branch. There's a creek. The green area is Corps of Engineer property. There is a creek uh, or drainage way. Rocky Ford Branch goes right up the middle of it. And you can see the properties in yellow and 400 foot feet out, you'll see marked in the magenta dashed line. Uh, <coughs> Ms. Rubin's property has the blue star on it in the lower center of the slide. And you can see in particular, and the reason this amendment uh, originally started get being discussed uh, between staff and the applicants uh, about half a year ago now, is that on her property you'll see that the impact is pretty significant and she's left with about a 160-foot strip between the buffer line and the edge of her property so you can get a road through and not much, but not much more than that in that location. Uh, it also consumes about three-quarters of her property. <clears throat> on this slide, we kind of wanted to illustrate uh, how, what these recommendations mean. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see a map. Everything in blue, if a property owner elects to develop well and septic subdivisions, they can develop any part of the properties. Everything in blue on that slide could be developed. Uh, so what that means is that a buffer would not apply. Um, the soils in this area effectively mean that most uh, property owners tend to find they can get a yield of 
Uh, typically, lot sizes need to be at least three to five acres inside before you can find a perkable field. So your lot yields with well and septic tend to be about 0.2 units per acre, sometimes 0.3 units per acre. Um, it also means that it does not mean that there needs to be a natural area. So on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, these could be subdivisions, uh, two, three to five lot subdivisions that have mowed lawn up to the edge of the core property if the owner wishes. Uh, probably the septic fields, so they can also be sited immediately adjacent to the uh, core of, of engineer property. On the right-hand side of the screen, <clears throat> this is the situation that would happen if any of the owners wished to develop using utilities. They would have to leave a 400-foot area uh, completely undisturbed, um, and then the blue area is the remainder you see on the right-hand side of the slide that could actually be developable. Um, the yield under the plan recommendation, remember, is you could get, the plan says you can do up to two units per acre. Uh, staffs looked at a couple of these saying, could you really do that without taking lot sizes down to a size that we probably don't yet have a precedent for in Chatham County. Some of these properties would need to go down to very, very small lots in order to get to that yield. Um, the other thing, and we mentioned in the staff report, that during development of the joint plan, a lot of discussion happened over those seven years about water quality impacts in Jordan Lake and whether we were better off with well and septic or public utilities. The town of Cary's position, and demonstrated through modeling and other research, was that, in fact, water quality is much better if you're on public utilities with modern BMPs rather than having septic fields and uh, livestock and so forth adjacent to core property. So this is some of the background that went into this plan. Now, other properties affected by the amendment request. <coughs> um, all the properties you see colored in this uh, beige salmon color on the slide also have land within 400 feet of core property, and they're also south of Martha's Chapel Road or Ludershop Road. If any of them wish to develop using the county water system or the town of Cary's uh, and, and don't have sewer services, they still have to abide by the 200, by the 400 foot buffer requirement. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means. But what, 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 this did, what this does is we've picked up another 237 properties that are shaded in beige on this slide. Uh, and we have about 1,153 acres inside of that 400 foot buffer that's affected. So this slide shows you what would happen uh, the developable area if you're using all well and septic. And once more, any of these properties that choose to subdivide using well and septic subdivisions, three to five acre lots, uh, they're free to come right up to the edge of the core property. But, and here if you're on the west side, the left hand side on this screen of the rural buffer boundary line, you can only get public water, but if you get public water, uh, you can't build anything within that first 400 feet, which on this slide is that magenta undevelopable area. Uh, what this means is that if you're doing a well and septic subdivision west of the rural buffer boundary, uh, you cannot plant any of your three to five acre lots inside of that 400 feet. So the yield goes down significantly for some of these properties. Um, now we wanted to kind of uh, talk a little bit about um, the applicant's um, uh, justification statement. One of the things that they put in their justification statement is asserting that, um, in their opinion, the 400-foot buffer is effectively putting a buffer on a buffer, that the Corps of Engineers already owns enough land to buffer the lake and even buffer the 100-year floodplain. So in this map, you can see the lake surface is in the dark, deep blue, uh, the core land uh, the 100 year flood hazard or the 100 year uh, event is shown in the light green around the lake. And then out beyond that, you see in the dark green the rest of the land owned by the Corps of Engineers. So they purposefully buy enough land when they built the reservoir to control for the 100 year event. They also bought enough for uh, raising the dam someday that if we ever need a greater water capacity in the region, they could add some feet to the dam, which would spread out the edge of the lake some distance so they buy enough for expansion of the lake. And here I'm going to zoom in now to the applicants area. <clears throat> so here you can see the 100-year uh, event 
uh, mapped in, and surrounding it in the dark green, you see the rest of the core property, uh, and hence the applicant's assertion they've got a buffer on a buffer. And the lake you can see in the lower left of the slide before you actually hit the water body of the lake, you're quite a distance from the properties. Um, <clears throat> and if, if during council discussion, you want any of the history of why all this is so and why this is in the plan, let me know, but that would take a little while, so we did not include it. I'm not including it now. So the amendment process. What happens if you want to amend the joint plan? Well, the interlocal agreement says that both the Chatham County Board of Commissioners need to approve an amendment and the Cary Town Council for it to be effective. Each local government follows their own way of doing business in considering a plan amendment. Uh, they do require that the Chatham Board of Commissioners needs to make their final vote first uh, before the Cary Town Council does. Uh, and effectively, if, they, if the Chatham Commissioners vote to approve the amendment, then it moves forward and Cary Town Council that you decide whether you want to approve or reject the amendment. Um, if the Chatham Board of Commissioners rejects the amendment, then it's kind of dead at that point because it can't be approved. So um, Chatham acts first. So at this point, the Chatham Board of Commissioners did get a head start on us. They held their first public hearing, and they will only hold one public hearing. Uh, Carrie holds two. We'll have a second one in front of the planning board. Their hearing was on March 21st, and they sent the case to, their Chat to the Chatham County Planning Board, and they heard the case. Uh, they discussed the case, I should say, on April the 5th. Uh, they had a robust discussion, uh, did not reach a final recommendation, and have continued discussion until their May 3rd meeting. Um, I can tell you some of the things discussed by the board as reported by uh, Mr. Jason Sullivan, the Chatham County Planning Director. Uh, they had questions about uh, carry zoning. What would we allow? Would we allow density uh, transfers between the 400-foot buffer area and outside the buffer? Could they do townhomes and multifamily or whatever on the part beyond 400 feet to get the yield and then keep the other part green? How did our zoning work? We responded to them and actually have provided them with a memo describing the zoning districts in Cary that would uh, be applicable in this case and that we really don't have an automatic transfer uh, situation set up in Cary. It'd have to be probably done through zoning conditions. They had questions about environmental impacts, steep slopes and streams information. They've asked their staff for more information as they continue their deliberation. Uh, their discussion included a suggestion um, that they not that no action be taken until 2017. The interlocal agreement says that at the end of five years after plan adoption, the two local governments assess the plan. And each planning department prepares at your direction a report of how well do we think the plan's going? Are there any requests to change it? Are we happy with it? Both elected bodies consider that report, and both bodies decide whether you want to reconvene the Joint Issues Task Force or committee. And if you do, then you will start, you can start talking about amendments or changes to the plan. So their recommendation is let's wait till 2017 before we do anything. We just want to point out that in 2017, it's also possible that the two governing boards could decide you don't wish to reconvene the Joint Issues Committee. Uh, it's not required to reconvene. It's only required to study whether you wish to reconvene. <laughs> so even if Chatham County wanted to, but we didn't, we didn't have to? Right. Okay. Right. The, the uh, interlocal agreement, it runs 10 years uh, regardless, and then it, it renews automatically for five-year increments up to a maximum of 20 years. Either party can opt out of the interlocal agreement with 60 days' notice uh, and the, by a resolution of the governing board. Uh, but that the process for a five-year reassessment of the plan is you all decide, the two governing boards, whether you wish to have the Joint Issues Committee sit again. So we wanted to uh, describe that assessment, and that's a uh, point of discussion by the Chatham Planning Board. Um, and they will meet again on May the 3rd next week. So that concludes our pre staff's presentation. I know the uh, applicant, Ms. Rubens, and her attorney, they're here tonight to speak. Uh, before you convene the public hearing, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. At this time, I would invite the applicant forward for their remarks.
Good evening. My name is Caroline Nickel um, from Stam and Danchi PLLC. I represent Ms. Kathleen Rubens. As we discussed, we're requesting the repeal of Section 3.4.2 of the Chatham County Town of Cary Joint Land Use Plan. This section establishes a 400-foot buffer adjacent to the Corps of Engineer property when public utilities are utilized for development in the portion of the plan area south of Ludershop Road and Martha's Chapel Road. Um, as discussed, this 400-foot buffer is in addition to the already existing buffer of the core property, as stated, a buffer on a buffer. Um, as you saw on the map, this buffer covers nearly 80% of Ms. Rubin's property, rendering it undevelopable. Um, if you look at attachment D provided earlier, you can see that the green area is already an established buffer um, adjacent to Jordan Lake. This additional buffer diminishes property values and limits future development potential. Other properties subject to the buffer are negatively impacted without a community benefit. As stated, without utilities, you could put a pump station, um, a private septic system, cattle right up to that property line. But once utilities are used, which as he stated as well, um, then you have that 400 foot um, area that you're not allowed to use at all. Um, Section 3.4.2 has a disproportionate impact on quite a number of the properties affected. Um, these affected landowners were by and large not aware of the presence or impact of Section 3.4.2 since it's not reflected on the plan map. Um, many of the affected landowners did not voice their opinions during the plan adoption process in spring of 2012 simply because they were not aware of it. Um, Ms. Rubens did not receive any sort of notification of this change and did not become aware of its detrimental effect on her property until she went under contract in November of 2015, um, at which point discussions began with what they could do with the property. Um, so we'd ask for your consideration in our application. Thank you. Thank you. Staff report's been completed. So we'll open the public hearing for 16, uh, no, <laughs> for uh, plan amendment 16 CPA 01 and it would invite, invite any other speakers. Good evening. Mayor and council members, uh, I'm not very good at this public speaking. I have to apologize ahead of time. Um, Could you state your name for the record, please? My name is Kathy Rubens. Thank you. I live at 971 and 969 Luther Road. I purchased this property back in the 80s as part of my retirement plan. Uh, it was originally 27 acres uh, with very little road frontage. I added road frontage in order to have a developable piece of property that I could use for my retirement. This is 30 acres that I kept in forest and paid taxes on for a number of years. Uh, lived in a uh, double wide trailer then put in a modular home so that when I moved and sold this as a development piece, they could fold it up and take it away. Uh, because I am now retired and, and entered the over 60 crowd, uh, have built a house next door to my sister's in Kenley, North Carolina. Uh, did that while putting my property on the market, had an offer on it, we were proceeding forward to sell my property and for me to enjoy my retirement. Uh, the offer fell through when during his due diligence he found out that 80% of my property has already been taken away, basically. So I am now not able to sell the property, not able to develop the property, and my uh, retirement is going to dwindle to a uh, welcome to Walmart. Can we uh, entertain you in any other way? Um, so this was kind of a kick in the stomach back in December, right before Christmas, uh, as we were finishing and getting the certificate of occupancy on my other house. Uh, 
and uh, what I had dreamed of all these years while living in temporary housing is now uh, being taken by government. So I feel a little disadvantaged here, uh, but I thank you for allowing me to speak and uh, hope that you will uh, look favorably on what we wish to do here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Hi there, I'm uh, David Farrell. I live at 1132 Marshall Carpenter Road. We've got a farm that's north of Ms. Rubin's land, uh, the D&B farm space. It's 70 acres, and it was about four acres of that land that will be deemed unusable, this buffer. Um, uh, it makes no common sense to me. I mean, Don, you race. This is a safer barrier wall in front of a safer barrier wall. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it's, uh, it was put there by a past... Uh, Chatham County Commissioner, I think, is a jab at Kerry. That was just my personal opinion. Everybody has opinions. But um, currently we're grazing cows there within that 400-foot buffer, and the creek looks fine to me. I mean, I don't, I don't see any issues with the creek. So I'd appreciate your support and uh, help us get this buffer done away with. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker for this rezoning. Anyone else? We'll close the rezoning and open up the questions and comments. And I'm glad the last speaker said what he did because that's my, the way I recall it. Yes. Purely political, purely against Kerry. We presented data that showed otherwise, and they didn't care. Well, I, so. I believe it was to appease the concerns of, of one of the committee members yep. from Chatham, who I also believe does not live in the area anymore. Nope. Right. So, and got unelected. Yeah. Got unelected. You're exactly right. Unelected and moved away. So I'm hoping that Chatham County will recognize that this is a buffer of a buffer and not necessary. And An invasion by Kerry, which is what they basically described us at back then. So. I got two questions, yes. or at least two, uh, that I jotted down. So was the – I don't want to assume any of what you've just said because I'm, I was, <laughs> I'm not going to – I'm not going to – I'm just going to say that let's assume it was done for some kind of good reason. Um, how would a septic field and pumping your own water provide better water quality in Jordan Lake than running a pipe out to take you fresh water and a pipe back to take sewer? That's what I'm trying to figure out. It doesn't. No. I, 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 right, except in the case of a carry. burst a burst pipe. I think that would be the only Even the only thing with a burst pipe that you're pumping. 40 houses downstream, and then all of a sudden a pipe burst. But in the septic system, one would fail individually. I think that would be the only thing I could see. Part uh, of it, one could have also looked at it if you keep carry water and sewer away from the area, then you restrict development. Okay. That is why. Yeah. Okay. That's so why then, the, rural buff, the rural buffer line. Right. Uh, okay. That was the major concern rules. back then, is they okay. wanted us away. Okay. Right. Uh, welcome to their backyard. The, the they being the non-property owners. The non-property. Right. Okay. That is correct. The governing body. The governing body okay. because the people were begging Kerry to come. All right. So then the second thing I had is that the, the, you mentioned the potential of if we needed more water, we could raise the dam. As I recall, that the, the, the Corps of Engineers is not really good at figuring out where water is going to go when you raise the dam. It, it never floods where they said it was going to flood. Didn't flood here where they said it was going to flood. There were tree stumps sticking up when they flooded it the first. You know, they tried to flood it. They weren't supposed to be sticking up. So I don't trust that. But in the event they do raise the dam, um, then then how do you then where does the hundred year flood on top of a raised dam go to? Because then you've in effect you've you've gotten rid of your hundred year flood if you raise the dam. Well, I, I think we're talking about many decades in the future. We have an allotment of Jordan Lake still. And so the other entities, and before they raise the dam, they're going to use that allotment. Right. And, and my understanding um, is, is a historical one, and you probably would, you know, I got it secondhand, uh, that back when the, the reservoir was originally being planned and designed, and uh, 
the, the state went out and the, you know, the government went out acquiring property for the reservoir back in the day, um, they had to figure out, well, how much land do we buy? You know, they're still doing engineering design. They're figuring out the size of the dam, the height of the dam, uh, how much will be impounded. So my understanding was at the time they looked at these sorts of things, the ultimate end game and how much they needed to buy. Whether in the last 10 or 20 years there's been any discussion about needing to do that, you know, I don't, I don't know. We'd have to ask some of our staff to contact the Corps of Engineers and uh, see if that's the case. Oh, there we go. The uh, original design for the lake was based on the storm that initiated the project in the first place. In 1945, there was a major hurricane, uh, dropped about seven inches of rain in 24 hours. And that's where the ultimate uh, size of the lake was determined, was to handle that storm. So the property that was purchased is based on where the uh, maximum overflow of the impoundment would be uh, if it ever got to that storm again. Now, we've not had that uh, occur since that time. But that's where the property purchase was based on. Now, where the Corps would choose to maintain the normal level, uh, the normal level is 24 feet below that elevation-wise. So uh, they could have the flexibility to raise the normal impoundment, which, you know, could affect the water supply. Uh, even just raising it a foot has a considerable increase in mm -hmm. the uh, water supply. Well, I remember it after Fran. I used to fish out there a lot, and, you know, a lot of the boat ramp parking lots and stuff like that were flooded, but I, I don't think it ever exceeded what you see here. But Right. And in January of this year, we actually we had back-to-back -back storms uh, back in December and into January. And it reached the, uh, it fell just short of the maximum that it reached after Fran, and it was still about seven feet short. Mm. Okay, the that, that helps. I had a quick question. This is the first time I noticed with the rural um, boundary line crosses some of these properties in question. There's two of them. So what happens there because there's different utility mixes? Oh, where, where this line. I'll move. Mm -hmm. yeah, where you yeah. see it, it takes off mm -hmm. not on property lines on the opposite side. Exactly. What happens there? There's a history there. <laughs> Is that one of those First hand or second ask? hand? <laughs> and Ms. Robinson may remember. Um, there, it, it, if I go, let me go bring up, um, it basically, there was, there were, it, the plan development started, uh, there were two governing ideas that start, it was the starting point for brainstorming what the plan should look like. And one of them was, there should not be any higher densities, meaning there shouldn't be anything with water and sewer within a mile of the lake. Uh -huh. So a one-mile buffer was drawn around the lake. Uh -huh. And if I bring up the slide, on the joint, oh, I got the wrong slide, hold on. I only go to a zoom in one of that. Okay, this one's better. Um, on the joint plan map, we actually, the map actually still has a half mile buffer, the half mile line from the edge of the, the mean pool elevation of the lake, and the one mile line from the mean pool elevation of the lake. Mm -hmm. And originally, nothing that was served by any utilities would ever be within one mile. Um, in the, either during plan adoption in 2012 or immediately before it, uh, some of the, um, I know uh, Mr. Farrell, uh, who spoke a little bit earlier, noted that some of the boundaries were getting kind of squiggly over here and near these properties. And on the carry side of the boundary, the rural buffer boundary, there we requested that we stick with full property lines. That right here, since the property line just went a little bit over the one mile boundary, from the one mile line from the mean pool elevation lake, let's go bring the whole thing in. When we got to the opposite side of that Rocky Ford branch, uh, the Joint Issues Committee decided, no, in that location, we'll just leave it exactly at the one mile from the lake. Okay. So it's a little bit odd. It's the only place in the, one of the places in the plan where you get that funny arc. The other funny arc that happens is right here, mm -hmm. uh, a little bit west of 55, of uh, higher, seven, NC 751 a little bit to the west. And that's, there's a plan note, or in the document it describes that um, it, it, we don't sp specify a distance, but that water and sewer service can 
you can serve properties on the west side of NC 751 uh, to some distance, and it depends on each property where you simply run your sewer line back under 751 and the elevations all still work for you. So that's trying to, the arc is, is conceptual there, just to say if your property can reasonably drain with a pipe back under 751 without needing a pump station, you can do it. But yeah, that's why the, on the arc is, is an application. Other questions? My only com I mean, I have comments. Comments? Um, I would support the request. I mean, I personally believe, and I think the data shows that piped water in, piped water out is much cleaner and environmentally friendly than well and septic. Um, I don't know that we're going to be your challenge. Um, as you've got to get Chatham County to sign off on it too. So um, not speaking for the rest of the council, of course, but me personally, in my opinion, that's your biggest hurdle. Um, mess up. <laughs> And they have to approve it first, mm -hmm. right. Chatham County. Mm -hmm. So as we send this on to Planning and Zoning Board, it goes through the process. But if Chatham County says no at some point, we don't ever get to see this back. Correct. And we will, um, uh, Chatham has asked for just summary notes of what transpires this evening. So when their Planning Board meets on the 3rd, they'll have heard, you know, the general theme of discussion here tonight. Uh, we will probably point them to the video for live by May the 3rd. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, they, 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 they've, they've been tracking the case here, too. Um, it will go to our planning and zoning board in, in the normal path. Uh, since we're already at the end of April, it would go not to the May but to the June planning board meeting. By that time, we hope that their board will have acted the, the planning board, and we will tell our planning board what the Chatham planning board said, <laughs> but probably their board of commissioners may not have taken action, I doubt, by then. So we, it, as the two parties move forward, we will provide each, we're providing each side. So tonight, I summarize what the Chatham board said at their first meeting, the planning board. When they meet next week, we'll say what happened at our hearing. When our planning board meets in June, we'll tell them what their planning board said in May. So we're, we're both sides are trying to keep each other, you know, cooperatively in the loop of how this is progressing through the process. But uh, we'll, well, see. well, since they're watching probably on a tape delay, um, I will say that I, I think it's safe to speak for the council that we all realize that Jordan Lake's our drinking source, and we're gonna, the last thing we're going to do is pollute it in any way. And so we want to protect it environmentally, as Mr. France said. This is the best way to do it, and so. Uh, uh, I can't speak for the rest of the council either, but this makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a cleaner, more environmentally friendly way to do it, and that's going to serve many people's needs that need this water source. So. Yeah, when I, I look forward as one of the last members of the uh, Chatham County Carry Joint Commission. It always seemed very unusual to me, especially now as we hear about this information. As, as we heard it on the Planning Board Commission as well, that piping in water and piping out wastewater is a more environmentally, a way to be more environmentally sensitive. For this east side of the rural buffer, that protects that land, but it doesn't protect it on the west side because they only get water in. They don't get any wastewater out from carry at least utilities, unless Chatham County wants to provide it or some, someone else. So I, I think it might do a great service for that area, but you know this is for all of Jordan Lake. So I, I'm I'm in line with you all. I think this is a better a better solution, and certainly more environmentally sensitive. Any other comments? Well, I know you you said you can't speak to the whole council. None, none of us can, but the whole council can speak, can't we? In a uh, in just uh, recommendation. It's usually well, it's out of order easy. to make a recommendation before it goes to plan. But you can offer your own personal thoughts. Okay. Well, my personal thoughts is that, yeah, the common sense, or I agree with the common sense thing. It just I asked that question earlier more rhetorically because I had no way of, I, 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 between cows being up to the next of it, next side of it, because I don't know uh, how Mr. Farrell treats his cow waste, but uh, my dad grew up on a dairy farm. They didn't treat the cow waste. So um, I'm just, uh, it, I would agree it makes common sense to pipe it in and pipe it out. Very good. So just so we're clear, like the Chatham County Commissioners, we also have an advisory board. This will go to them, I assume, June or May? Uh, I believe we'll, at this point, we're at the end of 
April, so it'll go to their June meeting. So they'll see it in June, and if things keep going, it'll come back to us probably in July. And that's correct. And assuming correct. that Chatham County recommended this change, then we would have a vote on this change at that time. Right. And just one final comment is both planning boards, of course, are free to recommend a modification to say, you know, the applicant, just like in a rezoning case, if they want to change text or say instead of deleting the whole section we wish to reword it or our board wishes to recommend something different, they're free to do so. Okay. Very good. Just one more question for clarification for me. You said earlier that either Chatham County or Cary could nullify the agreement with, what, 60 days notice or whatever? Correct. Either local government, uh, it's, it's in the... I was just looking this up a short while ago. It, yes, uh, either local government with 60 days advance notice by resolution can opt out of the interlocal agreement. Okay, but that doesn't mean that Chatham County still can't enforce what they want to enforce, correct? Correct. Okay. Anything else? All right, this will go to our planning and zoning board. Thank you, Mr. Ramage. You're welcome. We now move to our fifth and final public hearing. Is a public hearing for the... John Edward Orom Annexation 16A01. Staff's going to present a report, and Council may take action. Mr. Nicholas. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Uh, this request is for annexation of 26 acres of property located on High House Road, approximately 300 feet east of the intersection with Magnus Drive. The annexation also includes 1.58 acres of adjacent right of way. The property is in Cary's ETJ in its own transitional residential conditional use. The request is associated with Subdivision Plan 15 SB05, which proposes a total of 60 lots for detached dwellings. That concludes the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Nicholas. Now it's time for public hearing for 16A01, the annexation for John Edward Orham. And I would invite our first speaker forward. Anyone at all? Seeing no one, we'll close public hearing. Open it up to council members for questions, comments, or motion. Make a motion to approve annexation 16A01. There's a motion. Second. And a second. Discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Nichols. We now move to discussion items. Our first discussion item is 6.1, ratification resolution, the manners of the High House subdivision plan. Typically, the ratification resolution like this would be on the council's consent agenda. In this case, the property to which the resolution relates first needs to be annexed. So council needs to approve the related annexation and now council just approved the related annexation and now needs to approve the resolution. Is there a motion? So moved. A second. There's a motion and a second. Discussion. Everybody understands what we're doing, right? Yeah. Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. We now move to our second discussion item, Green Level West Road Widening Project from North Carolina 540 to Glenmore Road. Ms. Cove of our staff will present the report and council may take action. Ms. Cove. Yes, good evening, council. Thank you, Mayor. As the mayor indicated, this item is for your consideration of approval of condemnation resolutions to secure the necessary rights of way as well as the easements for the Green Level West Road Widening Project. I promise this is my only engineering type slide for this evening, um, but the project does extend essentially from just west of NC55 um, to NC540. The project will widen Green Level West to a four lane median divided roadway. We'll have curb and gutter, sidewalks, and wide outside lanes for bicycles. Uh, we received a grant for the design and a portion of the construction of this project, and the grant requirements have strict limits in terms of schedule. Here's just a bird's eye view of the project area, again with NC55 on the right-hand side of your slide and NC540 on the left-hand side. We have been working with the affected property owners um, trying to reach settlements. Uh, staff have been very busy uh, negotiating with these property owners. At the time of the staff report submittal, we had settled with one property owner. Uh, since that time, we're expecting to receive settlements, um, the paperwork essentially, from five others. Uh, three other people have agreed to a price and just have lenders involved, so we're waiting on that paperwork. And um, three remain under negotiation. So technically, we'll probably have six condemnations 
on three that have a grade to price but just need lender approvals. So to minimize disruption to that project schedule um, with the grant time frames established for that schedule, the staff is recommending that council approve the resolutions authorizing condemnation. I'd be Thank happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Coe. So just, just to restate what you've stated, we're running out of time, we're running out of options, and uh, we can't wait any longer uh, for this property to do the project. So in some cases, which is a last resort, we're going to have to condemn, and that's what you're asking for permission that's to do. You did a much better summary than I did. Thank you. <laughs> questions, comments, or motion? Make a motion that we uh, move forward with approved resolutions authorizing condemnation. Okay. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Second. Discussion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank, Thank you. You. <laughs> you keep you get me again. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Let's see. What have I got left? Approving the attached resolution. We just approved the recommendation. Now we got to approve the resolution. That was the recommendation. That was the yes. recommendation. So we need to approve the resolution. No, you're no. No, well, good. The next one, the tiger. tiger. Oh, she's here for the tiger grant. I'm like, well, what <laughs> is she The next two, for? I'm here for. So. Uh, doing All right. the third you were ready. It's been a long week. For yeah, me. A rough day for you. I know. <laughs> okay, we're moving to our third discussion item: Tiger 2016 Tiger Grant Resolution of support. Ms. Kova, our staff will present this report, and I actually know something about this one. So I was at Campo. So we oh, well, good. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And, and again, as the mayor indicated, we are seeking your approval of a um, resolution supporting a 2016 Tiger Grant application. Um, this project has been going on really for quite a long time, and even before I came to the, the town. Uh, the design started in 2007 and includes the extension of Walker Street from North Cedar Street to Chapel Hill Road, um, which is about 1,200 feet, and also includes a grade-separated crossing where the roadway would go under the um, tracks. Uh, it is a very challenging project, um, particularly with regard to all the issues associated with the grade separation and the multiple railroad companies and owners in that corridor. Here's an overview of the location. Um, this is from some of the original work we did in 2007, so you'll notice it's an old aerial, and a lot of things have changed in downtown Cary. Um, just to orient you, here's for the, the better. Uh, <laughs> um, so far. Here's the uh, the downtown park, um, and this <clears throat> is Academy Street, and Town Hall, and so Walker Street That's extension wild. underneath the railroad tracks here. Uh, the TIGER program was created in 2009 by the federal government, and it's extremely competitive uh, with many more requests than funds are available. Um, the town is very persistent. Um, we've had applied five times uh, with Walker Street really as our application each of those times. Uh, the Walker Street extension project is really the, the best project we have to meet the grant eligibility for the TIGER grants. Um, it's essentially shovel ready, which means we could start construction um, very quickly, um, and it's got a lot of positive uh, economic impacts, which is what the TIGER program looks for. Um, so after our, our last unsuccessful uh, submittal, we conferred with the Federal Highway Administration, who's the agency that approves essentially the grants, and as well as the Ferguson Group, who's been working with us on our next application. So we're hoping this one um, will meet all the requirements. The construction cost estimate is over $33 million currently. Um, we've successfully secured other federal, state, and local grants, uh, totaling a little over $5 million. Uh, the remaining need, obviously, is still very large at over $28 million. And so our grant application is for a little more than $22.5 million, uh, with an anticipated 20% match of over $5.6 million. Um, the grant applications are due tomorrow. And we're recommending that council approve the resolution. <laughs> yes, just in time delivered. Just um, <laughs> we're recommending <laughs> council approve the uh, resolution authorizing a town of Cary grant application for the Tiger program for the Walker Street extension project. And should we actually receive the grant as um, as asked for, so in the amount that we asked for, staff would be back to council to talk about the match requirements. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Cove. Did a very good job with that. Basically, this project's almost cost prohibitive unless we get federal assistance, and that's what we're asking for. And we think we score very well on this, 
and so that's why we'd like to put it forward. It went to Campo, and it was unanimous. They gave us a letter of support, and so uh, all we need to do the application now is get our support, and it's stamped and on its way. So, any questions, comments, or a motion? Make a motion to approve the resolution authorizing the town to apply for the Tiger Grant. Second. There's a motion and a second. Discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. And I see Mrs. Coe's name for the next one, so I won't get Thank confused you. this time. Our fourth discussion item is the master plan for future middle school, presently named M16. <laughs> Is it, a British, oh, is it a British school? Yeah. Miss Cove is going to present this item, and we may take action. Ms. Cove, you're up once again. Thank you. And last but not least, uh, for your consideration, is a joint use facility for a future middle school, um, again, currently known as M16. It's a very, very attractive name there. Um, M16 is proposed to be located near the Alston Ridge Elementary School which is off of Green Level Church Road and Kit Creek Road, which you can see approximately in the location of the Red Star here in the, the very top of this slide. Now here's a closer view of the actual site. This figure is from our Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Resources Master Plan and shows the site as a proposed site to meet future projected demands for indoor recreation, gym space, as well as multipurpose fields. Um, the Wake County Public School System reached out to us earlier this year um, as they were starting design for their, their middle school site. And um, with our positive past history of joint use facilities, the staff approached council in January, and you provided funding for a joint master plan, which is what you'll see the results of on the next slide. Um, the master plan for the site was completed with two options. Um, option A, as shown here, is the option with the joint town school use. And the detailed components are shown in your staff report. Now, the cost estimate for this option is a little over $5 million, uh, which is higher than staff expected it to be based on our past history of joint projects. Um, the site is particularly challenging from a topographic standpoint, so any additional elements that were added uh, for the town's use essentially created the need for retaining walls and other expensive items. So option B, shown here, includes just the Wake County Public School System middle school typical program elements as identified in your staff report. So staff recommends um, that the board proceed with option B, which is, again, the school program only facilities, due to the fact that we believe there are more cost-effective ways to meet the town's needs at our existing facilities. Now, the school system has a very aggressive design schedule, and that's why we're here before you tonight. Uh, we will continue to work with them on the use of any future school facilities that they build. And uh, lastly, uh, staff will continue to evaluate future opportunities on town-owned property, and based on funding availability, we'll seek to meet future needs uh, either through larger facility or elements at, um, such as artificial turf fields at existing facilities. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions or comments or motion? Make a motion to approve staff recommendation. Oh, B. Option B. Option, option B. That's what yeah. it says, yeah. I know. I'm making sure. <laughs> so we have a second. A second. Second. Discussion. I, I would have loved to have gotten A to get the extra ball field, but I understand. You know, one of my concerns is right up there next yeah. to RTP, will our citizens get the benefit of it? Or will we be paying for Durham County residents to come down and use our food? There are a lot of free residents right around. Yeah, no, yeah. there is. My concern is it's on the fringe. Yeah, it's on the fringe. Well, I have no concern about being on the fringe because we have so many carry yeah, residents around there. There's a lot of there. demand. There's a lot of demand, but if we can build those kind of facilities in a more cost-effective manner mm -hmm. nearby on, on town property, then I think we should do it. And I know most pressing Don. need at this point is a middle school. We, we, we are in such desperate need of another middle school in this town. So, What's uh, the time frame for getting that up, up, built? And it's, it's my understanding that they have funding for design but not construction at this time. Uh, wow. Okay. Well, hopefully someday it's not the fringe and we'll be farther out. I think it's Annex Durham. Yeah. Okay, we have a motion <laughs> and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Council. Coe. We're now ready to go into closed session. 
Uh, pursuant to GS 143-318-11A, 1, 4, and 3, I move that we hold a closed session to discuss matters relating to the location expansion, or expansion of industries or other businesses in the town, including agreement on a tentative list of economic development incentives that may be offered by town in negotiations, to consult with attorneys employed by and or retained by the town in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege between the attorneys and the town, and among other things, the council expects to receive advice concerning the following lawsuits. The town of Cary versus Ruby P. Mayo et al., the city of Fayetteville et al. versus North Carolina Environmental Commission et al., and to prevent the disclosure of information that is made privileged or confidential by GS 143-318-10. Second. Motion. Second. And the second. Discussion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? We are in close session.
reconvene our meeting and I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn. There's a motion and a second. Discussion? All I think you Please me. say aye. Right. Aye. aye. Any opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>